So I'm going to talk about gray water. And what is gray water? Why would you want to reuse it? So what is gray water? <clears throat> gray water is lightly used water. It has some nutrients in it. Maybe there's some dirt. There's skin, hair, salts. Um, but it's still pretty fairly clean water that can be used. Um, here in Oregon, it is legal to reuse gray water. And the sources of gray water are uh, the shower um, sinks, the kitchen sink, as long as it's not attached to a garbage disposal, and the washing machine. Toilets are definitely black water, and um, dishwashers, usually the soap is, is too, um, has too many chemicals in it to be reused in the landscape. So some reasons to reuse gray water. It decreases your demand on potable water. Um, it's actually pretty good for your plants. There's some nutrients in it that are beneficial. And it gives us a, a more of a connection to our water and how we're using it. Um, it also, if you're on a, a well, if you're on a septic system, by diverting gray water into the landscape instead of into the septic system, you're actually um, extending the life of your septic. And then there's also some other uh, benefits of using gray water. It can help restore your soil. It can be providing habitat for animals because you're irrigating native plants. Um, it gives you more resiliency because this water is, um, you know, it's being reused. Let's get to the codes and then we'll get to the more interesting stuff as quick as possible. Um, in Oregon, you need to get a Department of Environmental Quality uh, permit. Um, DEQ recognizes three types of gray water. So type one is untreated gray water that just comes directly out of your shower or your sink. If you're using your kitchen gray water, maybe it goes through some sort of filter that's catching um, food particles and, and fats and oils. So that's type one. And we're mostly gonna talk about type one gray water today. Um, <clears throat> type two is gray water that is passed through some sort of chemical or biological process. So it might go through uh, constructed wetlands or um, had some sort of chemical treatment. And then type three gray, gray water has also had some sort of disinfection, infectant added to it. So again, it's another chemical process. Um, <clears throat> and then there's three tiers. And probably most people here will be dealing with a tier one um, permit, which is a single family residence or a duplex that's producing less than 300 gallons of water per day. <clears throat> So this is gray water that is used for subsurface irrigation. So it's, it's type, ton, type one water. It's had very little treatment, if any at all, and less than 300 gallons a day. Uh, type two is probably more of a commercial or institutional gray water reuse, and that's between 300 and 1,200 gallons of water. And um, type three, is going to be, again, more water than that. So this is a daily water use. So if you want to install a gray water system, you first have to fill out the permit for DEQ. And part of that permit is developing a design or a plan for your gray water system. Um, they don't ask to see it but it's good to have a drawing. It, it can be a simple sketch that shows where your source of the gray water is, how long the plumbing is, and where it's being discharged into the landscape. Then you also need to develop an operations and a, ma a maintenance manual. And it could be as simple as, once a year, I'm gonna check the emitters and make sure the gophers haven't filled in the end of the pipe. So, um, so there is maintenance that is involved. Some gray water, if you are doing showers and sinks, 
often, it, usually you're actually cutting into existing plumbing because you're installing three-way valves and then the gray water plumbing. Um, those systems are need to be also have a plumbing permit from your city or county. <clears throat> so this is all information that's going into the form that you can get on the DEQ, Oregon D Department of Environmental Quality website. Um, and then you send the form to them requesting to reuse your gray water and you pay for the permit. It's actually pretty easy. The website is fairly clear to understand when you go to DEQ. Um, the form is something that you can actually fill out online and then print it out um, to send it in. Um, after living for almost 30 years with gray water systems, now I live in a house that doesn't have gray water, so this is getting me a little motivated to, to get my gray water system set up. So. Um, I, I went online and I filled out the form and it's ready to print and send in, so thanks for the motivation. <laughs> so the one general principle about gray water systems is that there are no general principles. These are all very site specific. They're very specific to um, each household because the number of people, the amount of water that you use, the kinds of soil that you're discharging it in, it's all gonna be different for everybody's individual site. So the elements of a gray water system, you've got your source. So that's, what is your water? Where is your water coming from? Is it well water? Is it city water? Um, then you have the collection plumbing. And if you are building a new house, that's an ideal time to put in a gray water system because your plumbing is exposed and accessible. If it's um, an existing house, then you are retrofitting. And so, um, you know, how accessible that plumbing is is gonna determine the kind of gray water systems that you can install. A gray water system can include a surge tank, filter, or pump, but I encourage people to do as simple a system as possible because once you start adding surge tanks and filters and pumps, then there's more maintenance involved. Um, there's more potential for your water to become black water because it's being stored. Um, <clears throat> and oftentimes, more complicated systems end up failing within five years because people just don't want to maintain them or they're too difficult to maintain. So you've got, um, then you have the distri distribution plumbing. And this is the plumbing that is in the landscape itself. Um, then you have the receiving landscape. So this is a very important part of a system is what is the water going to be used for and what are you irrigating? And then people, because the people using the system and maintaining it are super important. So what are the site considerations for gray water discharge? So you're gonna to want to take a look at where you want to discharge gray water and what are you gonna use it for? What are you planning on irrigating? And what kind of soils do you have? And what kind of drainage do you have? Because when you discharge gray water into the landscape, you want it to soak into the soil as quickly as possible so that you don't have any standing water. That's very important. Um, and ideally, you're discharging it into the top eight to 12 inches of the soil because that's your most biologically active and alive soil. And those microorganisms are part of the filtration system. So you're feeding those microorganisms with this slightly nutritive water, and in, in turn, you're feeding the soil. And so this biological activity is a really important part of your system. Um, so once you've chosen some areas that you might consider discharging gray water, you'll want to do a percolation test. So you're gonna dig a hole um, at least a foot deep, and you're gonna fill it with water, let it drain, fill it with water, get it saturated, and then um, measure how quickly it takes to drain. And so then you get an idea of what your system, how your system will 
um, work in saturated soils, it'll also give you an idea of how quickly water is going to drain away. <clears throat> so the slope of the land that you're discharging gray water onto is important. You want it to be less than 45 degrees slope because we don't want there to be an opportunity for water to run off. We're wanting to hold that water on the landscape as long as possible. <clears throat> then you also want to assess what is your source of your water? What is the water quality that you're starting with? And I know some people have high boron in their well water. So, um, so it's, it's already difficult to use that water for irrigating because a lot of plants really don't thrive in high boron water. So you may not want to be um, using that for gray water. Um, but if you have, uh, if you're using city water or, or well water that's not high in minerals, then that's ideal for gray water. Then you're going to take a look at how, um, what is your amount of gray water that you have to work with. So it's like how many people are in your family? How many showers do you take? How long is your shower? What's the flow of your water head? So these are calculations that you're going to figure out so you know that, oh, I have 20 gallons a day, or I have 150 gallons a day to work with. Legally, there, there are setbacks requirements for the different types of gray water that's being discharged. So you want to keep your gray water at least 100 feet away from groundwater, wells, and springs, um, 50 feet away from rivers, streams, lakes, or oceans, um, any stormwater management structures such as rain gardens, bioswales, and catch basins, you're discharging your gray water separate from those systems, so at least 10 feet away um, and two feet away from property lines. If you are doing type two gray water, so it's going through another type of um, filtration and also disinfection, I guess it's not disinfection, but it's like chlorinated, so that you're killing bacteria, then you can discharge closer to um, groundwater wells and springs. <clears throat> so this is a chart that is available, I think you can get it on the Ashland and the Medford websites, so it gives you a, a way of looking at how much water you're actually using. And after 30 years of living on a, a well that wasn't being monitored, it was really interesting to be on city water and I get a bill every month and it tells me exactly how much water I'm using. So I've been making charts and looking at, oh, well, this time of year, here's how much water I'm using for irrigation. And this is how much water I'm using just for household use. So um, if you don't have that, if you're not metering your water, then you can take a look at what are the fixtures in your household, how much, um, you know, if you look at your shower heads, Oftentimes, it'll have a number, like two gallons per minute, or the, the lower flows are less than two gallons a minute. If you an have an old shower hot head, it might be more. Um, another way of doing that is just taking a bucket and a timer and um, filling up, you know, timing it for a couple of minutes, and then you can figure out like how much water you're using in your normal shower um, length. Um, and then the same thing with washing machines. So the older uh, top load washing machines are going to have a lot more water that's uh, usable. Uh, the more energy efficient washing machines, we're getting down to like, you know, seven gallons per load to 15 gallons per load. So those will make a big difference in how you design your system because if you only have seven gallons once a week coming from the washing machine, then you'll just you'll divert that water maybe on one or two plants. Whereas if you have an old washing machine where you're getting 30 gallons and you're doing four loads of wash a week, then that's going to be a completely different system and a completely different um, landscape that you're sending that water to. So quick fix systems. 
Um, I've been to houses where there's, they've taken out the pee trap and just stuck a five gallon bucket under the sink. And the problem is that with that is you have to remember to empty it in your garden and you really want to do it every day or it becomes pretty stinky. Um, using a dish pan and just dumping water on, the, on plants, which um, Cora talked about, um, in the bucket in the shower, or why not put up an outdoor shower in an area that's gonna water the plants right around it? It's pretty simple, and um, since these are not plumbed systems, you don't need to get a permit for them. <clears throat> So I'm going to focus on simple systems that are either using gravity or the pump from your washing machine um, in, instead of the more complex systems. Because again, the simpler it is, the more likely that it's going to work for a long time with you know, less failure. So these two systems were developed by Art Ludwig, and they're um, documented in his books, Create an Oasis with, um, with Gray Water. There's um, also a really great book called um, Gray Water, Green Landscape that was written by Laura Allen. And both of them have really great details on how to size your system and all the information that you need and what the plumbing is. and um, and so these two systems that I'm going to talk about today came from Art Ludwig and Laura Allen. So the branch drain system can divert water from a sink or shower. You do need plumbing permits because you are cutting into existing plumbing and you're adding a three-way valve. Um, and this is important for all, of the, all systems, legal systems in Oregon need to have a way to divert the water either into the landscape or into your septic or sewer. So that means using a, a three-way valve. A branch drain system is depending on gravity. So your source of rainwater needs to be higher and so it needs to slope down to the receiving landscape. Um, it can be divided. There's um, what's called a double L. You use it backwards because you're using it to split the flow of water in the landscape. So you can um, split it and divide it up over uh, a greater area. Um, you need to have clean outs at the branches, and it needs to discharge into a mulch basin. And so mulch basins are a really important part of all of these systems. So the laundry to landscape is actually probably one of the easiest systems to install. Um, you're using the washing machine as the source. Um, Usually you don't need plumbing permits, but I would check with your county or your city. Um, uh, I would check first. Um, so you're using the pump from the washing machine to move water. So you don't want to move it uphill. It needs to stay either level or downhill. But if you have a fairly flat yard, it gives you a little bit more um, distance that you can move water into your landscape. Um, you're using basic plumbing, uh, basic irrigation tubing, so the HDPE poly tubing, usually one inch. Um, again, you're discharging into mulch basins and tree wells. It can be spread out amongst uh, multiple plantings. And what's um, you know what's great about laundry to landscape is that you don't have to get like into the plumbing under the house, um, you don't have, you're not concerned with whether your plumbing is downhill from your toilets. So it's much more accessible than, um, than showers in particular. So this is looking at just kind of a typical laundry to landscape. And so you have your washing machine and it already is pumping water up into the drain pipe. And so you include, you add a three-way valve, 
and then it can, you know, if you're lucky and your washing machine is on an exterior wall, you can just um, send your landscape water out through the wall. You want to make sure that you include a vacuum breaker or an air admittance valve because you don't want to continue to siphon water out of the washing machine. Um, and so that can be located inside the house or outside. Um, it also it creates a backflow so that water is not flowing backwards up into your plumbing. And then ideally it's sloped downhill or at least flat into, this is a mulch basin. So a mulch basin can be a channel. It doesn't have to be a big basin. So you can create like, you know, like you would do um, a tree well around the, the drip zone of your trees, of an existing tree. Um, or if you're doing new plantings, then you can create a basin and plant your plants on a little mound so they're not sitting down into, in the bottom of the basin itself. This is just kind of another look at some of the earlier laundry to landscape systems. Um, it's really important since this gray water is going into the landscape to label your systems so that people that are using it know that you know if I'm going to use something like bleach or or borax or anything that has a high salt content I'm not going to put that on my plants I'm going to send that to the septic <clears throat> so this is a little simpler idea or design for a laundry to landscape and so this is from Brad Lancaster who wrote the um, um, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond. So this is in um, some of his books. So each one of these pipes is just a two inch ABS pipe that, um, again, this is a gravity system. So each pipe goes downhill and this pipe waters a peach, that or waters the orange, that waters the white sapote. And so every time somebody does a load of wash, you move the drain hose counterclockwise. So Everybody using the washing machine knows how to use it. <laughs> but it's simple, it's very simple. It's just going from the washing machine into a mulch basin, watering your plants. Now, this is an older system where it's a lot of water that's going into what's called a surge tank. So what this does is your um, slowing down the distribution of the water, but this tank drains completely after every load of wash. So it's not holding water for any period of time. It's, it's just um, preventing a surge of water and it's distributing it slower. So once you go out of the washing machine into a one inch um, HDPE pipe, it's pretty simple how you can distribute it into the landscape. So you can see the one inch pipe is buried. I like to do them like in pathways so that you know where they are and you're not gonna dig them up for your garden. And then um, this is just using a um, T connector and instead of putting, you, you could put a piece of um, you know, half inch pipe on here to send it further away from the main distribution line. But um, the nice thing about this is that you can um, regulate the amount of water that comes out of that just by tipping the tip of the water of the, the tea up. So it allows you to, to really tweak your system and make sure that you're getting you know, as much water as you need on the plants that you're distributing, distributing it to. Um, so you definitely want to use soap that doesn't have high salt content. So um, um, there's Oasis laundry soap, which is actually supposed to be biocompatible. That's um, Art Ludwig designed. That was his um, 
master's thesis was to develop the soap. And then there's Ecos, I think, is another good soap. Um, some people use uh, Castile, like Dr. Bronner's. Um, and then I'm curious, and I'm looking into this, but now you can get these soaps that are just the, um, you know, it's like dehydrated. It's like those uh, detergent sheets. And I think those are pretty good for gray water systems. They have plastic in them. They do have plastic in them. Well, Ecos or, or um, Oasis laundry soap. Is Charlie's on the list of Nemo? Yeah, Charlie's on the list. Is Charlie's? Yeah. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure. But yeah, look at the ingredients. If we've got um, you know, sodium chloride in it, then you don't want salt, no boron. So this is just looking at burying the lines um, in an existing irrigation, so in the existing landscape. So you see there's a tree here and the pipe is buried and then each place where you're discharging gray water into the landscape, you can use a valve box and that keeps the end of the, the pipe open so you can actually take the cap off and visually check your system. Um, and then this will get filled in with mulch around these valve boxes and then this pipe will all get covered. And it ends up looking something like this. So the distribution line is just running through the pathway and then there's T's and each one of these valve boxes has a um, distribution point. So maintenance on these systems is fairly simple. Um, we all know that critters like to fill in these boxes, so you want to check them regularly and make sure that there's still water flowing. Um, in Laura Allen's systems, she leaves a pipe with an open end at the very end of the system so that if, any, if these all get clogged up, then the water's still going to have a place to um, exit the pipe so you don't get back up into your house. So this is looking at a simple branch drain system. Again, this is gravity fed, um, typically using two inch, you know, one and a half inch or two inch um, ABS pipe. It has to have a slope and it's um, a quarter inch per foot slope to make sure that, you know, if you have any, um, any solids, any debris in that water that is going to drain. And we don't have valves specific for gray water systems. So these are valves that are used on swimming pools. And so they're the only three-way valves that we have now to use for gray water systems. Um, but they're readily available. So, because a branch drain system, you're cutting into existing plumbing before you install a three-way valve, this is most likely a job for a plumber. And the really, the one of the challenging parts for these systems, especially if you're using them for a shower, to divert a shower, is how do you set up your three-way valve so it's accessible? Because if it's under the house, how often are you going to crawl under that house to change that valve? Probably not very often. Um, they do make um, electronic actuators for these systems, for those valves. So you could you know, run a, a electricity down to where the valve is under your house and then have a toggle switch in your bathroom. But they're just a little bit harder to maintain because they're not as accessible, they're not as, as easy to get to. So, if you're doing a bathroom renovation, that is the ideal time to put in one of these branch drain systems because then you can actually design in where the valve goes and making it, make it more accessible. So this is just looking at a cross section through a mulch basin, so, um, 
This is where you're splitting the valve and it's in, it's in a valve box so that you can actually take the lid off and, and make sure you clean, you know, it gives you a place to clean it out. Um, and then gray water is supposed to be discharged subsurface. So discharging it under a layer of mulch is considered subsurface. And the reason for that is because you just don't want animals getting into it. I mean, dogs love, um, they, they love all sorts of stinky things. So, <laughs> and if there's any food in it, then that's just even that much more interesting. So um, this is just looking at a valve box with holes drilled in the side of it and um, either a paver or just the valve box cover on top. And that's just, again, to make it easy to access and give you, um, you know, access to clean it out and maintain it. <clears throat> so most of us will probably be doing retrofits. We're not necessarily, so we're retrofitting our existing homes. Um, something to consider is instead of trying to collect all of your gray water into one um, discharge is to, to look at your home in zones. So um, here you have the washing machine. Why not just send the water outside the house right in that area where the washing machine is instead of trying to move it you know, far into the landscape? Um, again, here's, here's a tub. So this is the zone that this tub is, is watering. So um, and I like to think of gray water as a way of, of um, so you can irrigate fruit trees or per, you know, perennials. So you're watering perennials because there's plants that are staying in the ground that need water. Typically they need more water as they get bigger. And so I can grow trees that are irrigated with gray water that are gonna shade my house and it's gonna keep it cooler in the summer. And so I'm trying to stack some functions with what this gray water is actually doing. Um, this is just looking at the double L. Um, I think Art Ludwig sells these with the clean out port on his website. Um, and you can also do them yourself. It's just you're drilling a one inch hole and using a valve cap or a, a plug so that you can Access it, take the plug out, access it, make sure there's nothing clogging it. Um, we've also used five gallon buckets instead of valve boxes, and this is just showing you what's buried here in this basin. And <clears throat> so you can see this rock usually covers the hole. You can see, take the, the rock off, you have a visual. Um, you can visually see whether the system is working or not. Um, so this is a system in Arizona. So each of these mulch basins um, have gray water going into them. In Arizona, we don't have to separate our, our rain gardens from our gray water, which I actually think is good because gray water tends to have, it's gonna have more salts in it just because of the nature it's, you know, of the water, and I can use the overflow from my rain tank to go into these basins, and that just kind of helps flush the salts. Um, <clears throat> but I think because here in Oregon we get more rainfall than we do in Arizona, then um, so it probably ends up working out fine to separate your rain gardens from your rain, your gray water systems. And so this system actually really needs rocks or something over the end of it so that you don't see water daylighting. So this is what not to do. But look at all of these plants that you can water off of this gray water. So system maintenance, um, it's really important, especially if you're using your kitchen sink to, um, to filter out the gray water as much as possible before it goes into the landscape. So I really like using these screens. Um, and also scraping you know, bowls and dishes into your compost before just letting it all run down the drain. 
Um, and then also not dumping a lot of oils or, um, yeah, mostly oil because you don't want that clogging up your system. Um, this is just looking at a three-way valve and the, some of the oasis. So there's laundry detergent and dish soap. They're two different, um, two different soaps from Oasis. And I was going to talk a little bit about some common mistakes. Um, so sometimes you do need a more complicated system. If your source of gray water is downhill from your landscape, then you may need to have a system that has filters and pumps and um, but those are just, you know, just be aware that there's going to be more maintenance involved. It might be cleaning out grease traps, which, how fun is that? So, um, so, and when I did a search on gray water, I mean, it was just so many systems that had pumps and big tanks and, I, you know, so when you're, when you're looking for what people are doing, they're, they're probably over-engineering their systems. And um, so that brings me to the second uh, mistake, is that storing gray water for really any length of time, but um, the maximum is 24 hours because very quickly it's gonna become black water because there's enough bacteria, bacterial load in that water that um, it becomes pretty gross pretty quickly. Um, and so this is looking, they just cleaned out this, this is like the first filter in this three bathtub system. And it would have been so much easier to just put it directly into the landscape on the plants you want to water. Um, another mistake that happens is discharging the gray water too deep and you're like out of the biologically active area of the soil. Um, and again, they're putting in Sometimes they call these, these gray water septic systems. So it's being designed like a septic instead of like something that's being used to irrigate. So, um, and gravel and gray water system is not ideal because gra gravel becomes clogged really easily, you know, over years and it'll get um, slimy it just gets really slimy and yucky and then there's really no way to clean it. So it's a very heavy mess that you have to end up dealing with. So ideally you're using wood chips, which will break down, but they break down into soil, which is great. So you do have to clean out your basins and add more wood chips, but that's part of the maintenance process. Um, so discharging gray water when soil is saturated or if you have a high water table, um, you need a minimum of three feet between where your water is discharged and the water table. So if you have high water tables, um, that's not an ideal situation for gray water. And another mistake is that your basin or your, um, where you're discharging overflows and um, you do not want to have a surface flow of gray water. And so some resources, um, the Oregon DEQ has a really good webpage with information. Um, Gray Water Action is an organization that Laura Allen started years ago in the Bay Area, and they offer online classes. Um, they do a certification for people that actually want to do um, gray water installations. Um, and then, Art Ludwig's website, oasisdesign.org, has probably more information than you could ever want about gray water. So, um, yeah, those are the resources I would recommend. And are there any questions? My kitchen sink dumps into two buckets and I dump them. Um, do I need to be as careful with the, you know, the grease, the plant material, all that? It just goes in the garden, I mulch over the top, is that going to be okay? I think that, um, so she was saying she puts her kitchen gray water into two buckets and just carries it out and waters the garden. 
Um, that's what my dad always did as a kid, and they had great gardens. So, um, so I would just, you know, keep an eye on the soil. It seems like it's getting, you know, gunky. Then, no, that's the area. Yeah. The so. skunks eventually find some of the stuff, but you know, I don't care if share. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that would be that would be an issue, though. If you're in town, you may not want to be um, attracting birds. But, but yeah. What was the problem with the garbage disposal in a gray water system? So because people put food down the garbage disposal, that's the reason. Trying to keep as much food particles out of the gray water as possible. So if you have a double sink, sometimes the, the disposal is on one sink and you've got a second sink, so you can use, divert the, the water from the sink that does not have the disposal on it. 